Hey everybody, and welcome to TGIK number 127. And this episode is a is, is definitely a first for TGIK. We're gonna be I'm gonna be co-presenting with my very good friend Steve Wade. There's some really interesting technical stuff that's happening here. I'm leveraging an open source project called OBS.ninja for this. And Steve is in the UK. So let's say hello to Steve. Hey. Welcome. Thanks for having me. I'm glad you're here. I'm I'm really stoked about doing this episode. This is just gonna I think it's gonna open up a whole new a no, whole new area of opportunity for us to really like make TGIK rock. Um, it's been a fun thing to explore. <clears throat> I'm gonna make sure I can get back to my chat here and see how everybody's doing in the chat. Restore chat. Hey we'll leave. Hey Maddie. Give me one second to kind of like arrange things a bit. You know how it is. All right. Who we got going in here? We got Waleed signing in. Good to see you. And we got Alex saying hello from Atlanta. And we got Sevi saying hello. And Reiko from, tropi from tropical Germany. Is there like a place called tropical in Germany? Or are you saying that it's actually like tropical weather in Germany? It's probably <laughs> just tropical weather. We're not used to it over here in Europe. All right. <clears throat> the Maddie saying hello. And Ham Cabeza saying hello. And Liam also from the UK. Good to see you, Liam. And uh, we got David Michael saying hey. And Tim Downey from the East Bay. So we got people like it's funny we have people on either side of our our uh, our, our yeah, it's cool. here a little bit. Uh, folks saying hello from Helsinki. Hello from Munich. And Nuno saying hello. Good to see you, Nuno. <clears throat> and Keith. Keith is from Ireland. Which I think is maybe just a little bit closer to me. No. No, farther away. Farther away. Thanks, Bill. For if totally screwed. Yeah. All right. Bring no, on the noise. Mr. Brian Lyle oh, saying hey, and Chris Cardi checking in. Pull the geared bear from Portugal. Good to see you. Joy. Awesome. Mona from Germany, and George is helping us out behind the scenes today. So. He put up another link to the to the notes. If you want to follow along on the notes, it's tgik.io notes. And Rada saying hello from Arizona. And Christopher, hello again from Germany. We've got some good representations. Good to see you all. Hey. <coughs> yeah. Steve and I have done uh, a bunch of stuff together. We've like, you know, been I've been we've been kind of communicating since Cube was like a much bigger part of like. Tectonic and Core OS, so it's great to it's great to have you on, and I think it'll be a really fun conversation, kind of digging into what's happening with uh, what's happening with the GitOps space, because I know that you've been doing a lot of work with that at Metal, right? For sure, yeah. We're heavy users of GitOps, so hopefully we can uh, embed some knowledge. Yeah, that'll be awesome. We got Cody McCain saying hello from Fort Worth, Texas. I keep forgetting that you're in Fort Worth, Texas, Cody, but it's good to see you. We got hey, Cody. Christoph from Dusseldorf and. I'm going to slaughter this name. So I'm going to say hello. Bojanche. Bojanche? I'm guessing here. Arun from Dubai. Good to see you. Daniel from San Jose. Robert from Boston. And Eduardo from Costa Rica. And Paul saying, wait, there are two people? Yes. <laughs> it is amazing. It's really fun. Yeah, it was really good. My friend, my good friend Rory. And he lives in a town in Scotland that you could probably pronounce, Steve. It's like Gullail Head or something like that. <clears throat> and Eric saying hello from Wisconsin. Good to see you. And Daniel. Awesome. Very excited stuff. All right. Well, let's let's check in with what's happening with the community and the space. Let's kick over to screen and face. You can see some changes. So now there's two of us, and the chat's like a little more abbreviated down below, but I think. We can kind of see what's happening here. So <clears throat> this week in core Kubernetes 119 uh, release candidate four is out and it's still on track for an August 25th ish release. So that's pretty exciting. Um, component status. And this is the, the tool that you know, when you do kubectl, what is the command? kubectl get components or something like that. What is the command for that? Do you remember? I think it's components. I might be wrong. Uh, 
get component statuses. Yeah, and so like, and it's been broken for a while. Like I think we can see in these examples, right? It's actually trying to to do a health check on the controller manager and the scheduler, um, but where it's running from, it doesn't have that connectivity. So this has been kind of coming and going for a bit. But what we see, um, but what we see here is a, a pull request to market deprecated, and that means that you know as we let's uh, I'm in the wrong tab here. There we go. So it means it's going to be marked deprecated and it will eventually be removed. But just remember that like deprecated does not mean removed. In fact, most of the time when the ticket is open, I think that the, this one was opened by Jordan. Frequently this will have some detail about when it will actually be removed. Looks like it's been work, being worked on for a little bit. Lamadi, it's uh, Legavalin 12 year. Yeah, I don't see where the removal is, though. Usually that's like another. T so I think it's like two or three versions behind a deprecation, but I can't remember exactly what the number is. Well, we'll figure that out. It will be removed. What else do we have going on? What's new with all the boring stuff these last few weeks? Stephen Augustus wants you to know very large SIG testing rele release effort to clean up tests, pruning backlogs and very boring things. Um, and I think that, you know, Stephen is really good at like making that sound like it's not a lot of work, but it's actually quite a lot of work. Like, and I know that, I know that a bunch of folks are really like hands on keyboards working super, super hard to try and get a lot of these things done. And, and improve the uh, testing and release cycle. Um, also, you know, lots of big changes that have happened recently, like moving from GCR. Uh, moving, moving the backing for kh.gcr.io. Um, it used to be like uh, hosted entirely by Google, and a lot of the folks that are making use of links to images that were hosted in that old state are going to have to make a jump to point to kh.gcr.io. We covered that last week. Joe mentioned it. Um, but yeah, lots of lots of good stuff happening, uh, lots of big improvements, lots of new changes in the ecosystem today or this week. Before we do that, let's check it out. Let's see how's everybody doing. Sarab saying hello. Noel from Argentina. Laven saying hey. Steve, Lamadi wants to know which whiskey did you pick. So it's Le Gavelin 12 year. So smoky. It's it's nine p.m. here. It's a Friday night, so it's it's whiskey time for me. That's right. I still have a, I still have a couple hours, but I definitely enjoy a, a good whiskey. We got Alex saying hey to Adrian, and Adrian saying hey back, and we got Peshu saying hello. Awesome, good to see you all. So in the ecosystem, we got Open Service Mesh, which is a new project by Microsoft. There's been a, a significant amount of, um, you know interest and drama and stuff happening inside the space it turns out there were some you know in trying to get out and trying to get out the door there was like a quick merge of code that was borrowed pretty much uh, verbatim from uh, Linkerd and stuff like that so I think that uh, Microsoft has done the right thing in just removing the code for now and figuring out how to uh, what the right model going forward is uh, I don't think that they intended to uh, plagiarize so heavily from Linkerd um, but you know I think that uh, they're looking to address it. They want to make sure that they do right by the project. As I, I think that they've worked with Linkerd pretty heavily in the past, and they, they definitely don't want to like uh, have a bad situation there. Happy sysadmin day last week. Um, oh, also, I was going to show you this other service mesh I heard about that just came out um, that apparently is good for mainframes. Um, <laughs> brought to you by Mr. Kelsey Hightower. You know, always always right at the cusp of humor. Already got yeah. already got ninety four stars, so it's a it's an up and coming new uh, service mesh. Definitely, I think it pairs well with no code. You know, like if you're if you've written your applications in no code, then you should absolutely be able to interconnect them leveraging mesh. KHM, yeah, exactly. Kelsey CTL. <laughs> that definitely made me chuckle. 
Copy, the folks are saying that your uh, volume's a little bit low there. Oh, I can turn that up some. How about that? Is that better? Service meh. <laughs> nice, Paul. Everybody got me a little better now? Good. Thank you very much for the feedback. <coughs> also, it's, my microphone's over here, so if I put my hand in front of it, obviously you can, you'll can you be able to detect that, so I should not do that. Uh, so happy Sasset, happy sysadmin day last week. And there's actually some pretty fun stuff. Like I was watching uh, one, of my, one of my favorite Twitter pundits is uh, Corey Quinn. And he was putting out a bunch of uh, ancient sysadmin knowledge, which is always kind of a fun, snarky thing. Definitely check that out if you're looking for a chuckle. Emmanuel Evans dives into deconstructing Kubernetes networking. So this one, let's see. In the first post of the series, deconstructing Kubernetes, we set up an extremely basic or more or less functional Kubernetes cluster with one node. Going multi-node. I think this is like, you know, come along with me as we explore it the hard way kind of thing, which will be fun. You know, there's always lots of learning around how this works. Pointing at a completely unsecured API server. I think I want this person to understand about kubeadm because I think that there's a real value in while in, while exploring this stuff like you know in its base form I think that there's actually a lot of a lot of uh, benefit in just you know having some abstraction for how to manage these things he gets into networking talks about how it works what are they using to do the networking piece talking about bridges and beats some of the base components that make up networking pieces. I'm actually building a series of talks at cube.academy on networking, so that should be available soon. And they're talking about how wreaths work. Wreaths are basically pipes. Pretty interesting stuff. And it's kind of basically when traffic gets routed up to a pod IP, that traffic like comes to the node where that pod IP is residing first and then hits a routing tape, hits a routing connection straight up to the other side of that wreath. So anything coming into the node side wreaths goes out the uh, pod side wreath or inside of that network namespace in the same way the other way around. Now there's some, there's some, there's definitely some really interesting uh, twists and turns that, C, that different CNI providers put things through, but that's an interesting one. Okay, here we go. So CNI plugins, host local. So this is with no CNI. This is just the built-in stuff. That's pretty cool. So this is just the built-in stuff directly uh, available as part of the CNI package itself. So using host local for this stuff. And then I wonder if they get into... It's kind of like kubeadm the hard way. It is. Yeah, I mean, it's still Kubernetes the hard way, but they're looking at like, you know, what can we do without like actually engaging with like one of the other CNI providers that are out there, like Calico or Flannel or mm -hmm. any of those things. They're just, they're just using the tools that, are, that come in the box which is exciting. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of neat things you can do with that stuff, but I haven't seen somebody actually try to explore host, no host local networking for this in a while, but it is pretty neat. Wait a minute. What are they doing here? Special multi cache address for what? If the packet isn't going to the pods local network or a special multi cache address, then masquerade. Why a special, What did I miss with this? Oh, it's down there, the NAT. Yeah, but the NAT has nothing to do with multicast. I'm curious, like, why they're doing multicast. Like, if this was actually, if they explored this because they were actually looking to solve multicast on Kubernetes, which is a, it is definitely a challenging thing. But anyway, so interesting article, exploring different things about networking. If this is an area of interest for you, definitely, definitely check it out. We got uh, monitoring SCD. This is a real, this is, I think this just came out, yeah, was it today? No, yesterday. So a new article, I haven't had a chance to check it out yet, but it's always exciting, I think, to see like companies and uh, different groups like actually giving some love to SCD since it is the core of the cluster and figuring out how to manage it and monitor it and those sorts of things is pretty important. But I wouldn't say that like a ton of distributions of Kubernetes really spend a lot of their, a lot of their time focusing on it, which is challenging. 
when it comes to operationalizing things. I know that you've had some challenges there. Do you want to talk about like what you've hit? Yeah, so at, at Metal, we wanted to make sure that um, we have ephemeral nodes, right? And we can handle node outages and node loss. So one of the things that we spent a lot of time doing is working out how we could handle the loss of an etcd node and recover gracefully. So the way that we do that is obviously we're running in Amazon and we, rather than having a, an auto scaling group where the, the, the kind of data directory comes up as part of that auto scaling group, we have decoupled the two. So we have an auto scaling group that brings up a node and then kind of like a volume that lies around underneath. Um, and then as part of the nodes bootstrapping process, it goes and establishes a connection to that um, EBS volume where the data resided. So that just means that the kind of the maintain the maintenance of quorum is faster and it's faster than the, the whole consensus algorithm kicking off with a brand new node that is completely empty. That is awesome. That reminds me of a project that uh, my friend named Quentin Machu worked on for a bit, which, which was uh, called the was it the etcd cloud etcd operator. It was etcd operator. Yeah. Yeah. Based very similar on that. So they're looking into they're exposing like how do we actually. Um, monitor it because etcd is a secured interface for things and you can actually configure etcd to have a different metrics endpoint than the than the client or server endpoint there's a bunch of different things we can do here but they're getting into some of the detail about like how we have to authenticate to even get to the the metrics what metrics are exposed what things you're supposed to, we should be looking for uh while lead points out that um if you're looking at the uh the openshift um interface or if you're looking at the openshift ui that they actually do ex they do expose etcd metrics up at the top which is awesome but definitely calling out etcd node availability whether there is a leader how many f how frequently the leader changes yeah and for and for people that don't know if you if you want to live a little bit dangerously there's actually an insecure metrics port as well that mm -hmm. allows you to be able to get this uh, metric data back without having to establish a, a secure connection that's true they're also calling out consensus proposal, a proposal is a request or write request or configuration change request. So like when you actually, uh, when the API server serializes data to etcd, that would be a consensus proposal. So proposals failed total, like how many times data didn't, didn't actually persist and they're looking for like a maximum of five and they want to to like understand when those things happen. They're looking for disk sync duration. So this is uh, the question of, so I, I've heard me, I'm sure you've heard me say this before, but like etcd is very IO sensitive. Um, and that's because it has to persist those rights and it has to persist those rights across each member for it to have that guaranteed right effect. And so what they're looking for in this disk sync duration is how long it actually takes to persist those rights. And as you, as you increase the, you know, perhaps the other entities on that node that are consuming IO, you can see effectively the wait time for commits on etcd to go up. I've seen scenarios where like a very aggressive log monitoring solution was like sending mad amounts of logs from disk, right? And that represented a, a pretty significant IO, a, a pretty significant amount of IO, and that was actually causing etcd to uh, ungracefully decay. <laughs> you know, like it was, it was definitely it was definitely starving it for I/O, and that's where we, and we were able to detect. One of the ways that we could detect that was actually seeing the the duration for um, sync go up or climb. And then Sysdig has now some monitors for it, so deploying Prometheus. assisting dashboard doing it so that's all pretty cool i mean like i think i like that they call out like what particular pieces and parts are important to watch and why like that i love articles that like get into like do this but don't just do it because i say so do it because of this other thing like actually have good reasons behind it you know that's good stuff i like to see that we talked about that we talked about that what you can bring your sysadmin. Quake Cube. I've seen so many different examples of this, but it always makes me chuckle whenever I see a new one. Uh, so this one is uh, basically a way to expose, uh, if you ever played Quake back in, what is it, the 80s, 90s or whatever, like this is a way of like exposing Quake as a, um, 
other piece of software on top of Kubernetes, and I wonder if, I suspect, but I wonder if they allow for, makes use of IO Quake. So this is just straight up hosting Quake. David's saying a, uh, a TGIK on Quake. Yeah, that would be fun. Yeah, that would be fun. Uh, you know, Joe did a series, has done a series on actually like um, building an operator around uh, Minecraft. Minecraft. Minecraft, yeah. And so that that's pretty similar. I've seen another one where I can't remember what is it called, Cube Doom? I think it's called Cube Doom. Is that right? Similar again to Quake, but in this case, uh, Cube Doom is playing Doom and killing pods. I'm sold. <laughs> So like, that, that's my weekend. <laughs> that's your, your weekend lost right there. Yeah, that's game over now. Yeah. And there's like a few different examples of this. You know, like at, at KubeCon, we had one that was like a, a whack a mole, right? Like where you would hit, you would hit the, you'd hit the mole with the hammer and that would cause the pod to die, but it would be replicated almost instantly. And then you would see the pod come back up and that kind of stuff. You do need to get back on the series for Minecraft. That was a really fun series, Joe saying. I need to get back on that one. All right, so pretty cool stuff. And then our last article is about how we learned to improve Kubernetes cron jobs at scale. Talking about some of the work that Lyft is doing. I've got some good friends over there working on Kubernetes and that sort of stuff. It's a pretty exciting space. Lyft is using it pretty heavily. So this is for users of Kubernetes cron jobs, anybody building a platform on top of Kubernetes, what will you gain from it? insight into how it works. Basic familiar with the cron script, familiar with sidecar pattern. What are we doing? The cron job controller is a piece of Kubernetes control plane runs in the controller manager. Okay, let's get down to like what's happening here. 500 cron tasks with more than 1500 invocations per hour in our multi-tenant production Kubernetes environment. Repeated scheduled tasks are widely used at Lyft for a variety of use cases. Makes sense. Manipulating data or whatever. These are executed using Unix cron directly on Linux boxes. Developer teams were responsible for writing their cron top definitions. As part of a larger effort to containerize and migrate workloads, we started to adopt the Kubernetes cron job. Like many... All right. What's so different about Kubernetes cron job versus Unix cron job? Basically the way that it gets instantiated. So I think they're gonna get right down into the detail here, like getting into like processing latency, scheduling cron jobs, pod execution, handling failure. Cron jobs actually are, the cron job task within Kubernetes has a, has kind of an interesting thing in that it can keep a number of jobs that have failed around and that's a separate configuration point than keeping the number of histories for successful jobs. Like you could, you have a lot of leeway there in configuring like what stays around so you can go back and see what, what happened or didn't happen. They were seeing some random failures. So yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to dig into this too much because I want to get to the fun stuff of what we're going to work on today. but. This looks like a very detailed article. Uh, if you're interested, or if you worked on the, if you if you're running cron jobs locally, I definitely recommend I recommend checking this one out. This looks like a really good one. Let's see how. The we... Maddie to, to your point as well. Sysdig they put out some amazing, well-written articles. Like I've used them a couple of times at Metal to kind of derive the way that we do things. And yeah, I'll, I'd plus one that if I was on the chat. Yeah. Move over to Chaos Engineer. <laughs> I love it. Move over to Chaos Engineering. Welcome, Doom Engineering. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Very cool article. It'd be fun to dig into that one a bit more. All right. Well, let's move on to the next portion of our chat. So this is actually also a first, like typically I don't have slides. Uh, I don't uh, generally have slides when doing TGIK, um, but I think that these are gonna be representative of pretty decent talking points. And the first thing that Steve and I are gonna wanna focus on is like just kind of framing the conversation around like 
um, GitOps and how it works and what that's and, and what it does. Duffy, what are your thoughts about creating immutable in, immutable cron jobs in Kubernetes? So if one fails halfway through, how do you recover? Tricky topic. What is? I, I guess I'm struggling with the word immutable in relation to cron jobs. Like the idea being that you can schedule a job, and if it fails, do you want it to like retry? Are you talking? Are you talking about like the focal point of like retrying a job if it fails, or do you just let it fail and pick it up the next time it comes scheduled through? Is that where does you're he, headed? Does he mean ID impotent rather than? Um, immutable. It might well be. Yeah, I didn't put would make a little more sense. Yeah, <laughs> fact. I didn't put is your friend for anything distributed. It's very true. Amen to that. Yeah, I guess it depends on like what what the work is, right? Like if you're going to be doing work that um, modifies a bunch of things, you're going to have to have some. You have to have some way of determining like where you are in the scope of that work. Like, has it already been done? Do you have to do it again? Like, or, yeah, how do you detect that you're already in that in, a, in already in a mutated state if your job is to mutate, mutate stuff? Mr. Scotty Ray saying hello. Good to see you, Scotty. Scotty is a good friend and fellow motorcycle rider, and has just gone like on a big long motorcycle ride with another good friend, Nathan Ness. So good to see you checking in. Yeah, item potent means that you can rerun, reapply something, and the end result is the same. So. Item potency means that, like, if you were, say you were going to, like, migrate some database tables or whatever, right? And you could just rerun that migration script over and over again and not have an adverse effect on the database. And that would be an item, uh, an item potent task. And there are ways to solve item potency. Like, one of the ways to solve it is to understand, is to have some way of introspecting where you are in the work that is being done so that you know whether you can go forward or not go forward. There's ways to solve it wherein you say, I need to make it so that this work will always just continually work, right? Kubernetes is a pretty good model for that sort of thing. If you apply a deployment to Kubernetes and you apply the same deployment like 15 times, nothing's really going to change on the back end because it's the same construct, right? Like it's going to take that declarative uh, implementation. As long as nothing's changed in the, in the description of it, it's going to continue doing the work to maintain that uh, declared state. Pretty cool stuff. Mr. Alexander Brand checking in. Good to see you, Alex. Hey, Alex. Um, but non impotent stuff is a very different gig, right? Like if you if you have a state where if you're going to make a change to a thing and you have no way of determining whether that change has been made and you're still in a state where you actually have to like, you know, this is kind of like the at least once or uh, if only, only once problem, right? Like, yeah, the exactly once problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely a challenge. So this slide talks about like what we're trying to an important example. Software shifting gears in a car could say shift up, shift gear three. The letter would be an important. That's true. Yeah. Like which one is shift up? So in this slide, we're talking about like we're kind of framing the the GitOps conversation. So I always like to I always like to lead with this question. It's like my go to question pretty much no matter what is like what problem are you trying to solve? Um, and then let's just talk about like what the what these things are and how they work. So, GitOps typically, in my mind, and I'd love to hear your your opinion as well, is trying to solve the problem of ensuring that we have an audit trail and a change log for all changes to the deployment or configuration of an application. Um, to have a way to customize the deployment of an application in some site specific way, and we'll talk about those things. So, in this way, you can kind of have a source of truth for how things will be deployed or configured. But you might have things that are very specific to a particular area that you would want to modify, like maybe it's a different set of certificates or a different host name pattern or an FQDN pattern or what have you. Um, you want to ensure that a set of applications is deployed consistently across lots of sites, not just one. Um, and you want to understand or report on the drift in case uh, things, in case folks actually have the ability to modify the configuration of things, like at one of those sites or at some subset, you'd want to have a way of understanding that that had happened, and kind of reconciling it back to what is the desired state that you have defined in some single place. Yeah, and I, th I think Duffy, to to those points, that it's important to realize though that w with GitOps, it's again desired state, right? You're desiring the state that you would like the system to be in. in Git. And there is going to be an agent or a set of agents that are 
running inside your cluster or multiple clusters mm -hmm. um, that will try and reconcile that state uh, to be reality. And it's very similar to how Kubernetes works, right? We're, we're declaring state and Kubernetes as a kind of orchestrator is trying to get us in that, in that state. Yeah. And I like Gavin's call out. This is a very great example. Um, you know, the ability to have to, to uh, introspect changes in the way that you might introspect changes in code, right? Like having a GitOps model is really nice for that in that you can, you know, somebody wants to make a change and then you can actually get other eyes on that thing and go, I don't know, like maybe that's not a great idea or <laughs> because of this or sure looks good to me. You know, like you're not, you're not kind of doing that in isolation. Hey, Gavin. Hey, Josh. Good to see you. Josh. Good to see you. So yeah, I think that's a good summary. Um, and, and to your point, Steve, I think this is like the next one I want to I'll point out here is that in my mind, um, people frequently paint GitOps as one solution that tries to solve how we have Chris too. Wait, did Chris sign into? Oh, we're I missing think the Chris. Are they, are Chris and Brian there? Got it. I was like, dang, that would be amazing. It'd be like another anniversary episode. I can't remember what episode that was, but we had like an anniversary episode where everybody who had been on the show was part of the show. It was really good. I would guess 100, but maybe I'm wrong. I think you're right. I think it was 100, which would be really easy to remember. But anyway, so I was saying that I think that people paint in their mind when they think about GitOps, they paint this picture of you have a Git repository where you keep the configuration for things that will be deployed. And you have an operator or some software running inside of your cluster that monitors that, um, that monitors that repository and applies changes when those when those changes are relevant for that cluster, over time. Um, but I don't think that that's the only definition of it. And I think that really these two different things these these two things are are somewhat separate, right? In my opinion, GitOps represents that first part, like having a Git repository where you have where you maintain a desired state for those things that would be deployed, is GitOps. But how you go about deploying it, I think is a little bit over open to interpretation, both in the model of how those things are applied to clusters, like whether they are a push or a pull. And also even, even in the case where you do decide to go for a pull model, which is the more common case for GitOps flows, there's a bunch of different uh, models for how to solve that or how to, how to interact with that. What are, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I, I agree, right? So, so GitOps is, you know, for me personally, the way I like to think about it is again, it's a, centra a centralized location for configuration, right? And the way that the configuration ends up in uh, your end destination or your end cluster is completely dependent upon the way you want to the way you want to go about it, right? You've got the option of pushing those changes in, but they are still in Git, or you've got using Git and pulling them in inside with an agent that's running already there. So I think you've got you've got two models, but the GitOps kind of paradigm is centralized around. Git being the source of truth or that repository or set of repositories. Yeah. So we had a couple diagrams here to talk through and then we'll get into like playing with a couple of the repositories that Steve has created to play to explore these things. And so um, I think this is a fun one because this kind of like captures like the way that a lot of folks uh, do this stuff and have been and have done since before there was a Kubernetes and probably continue to do uh, long after there is a Kubernetes. Does GitOps obviate the need for admission control? I don't think it does. I think that no. I think that it does introduce a new opportunity to. Um, I do think that and you and actually have done a bunch of work on this, which I think is pretty awesome. The, um, if you have a GitOps flow, then you can generate a set of manifests that you can evaluate with code, uh, like you know. That, that, that you can use it, that you can evaluate and understand whether it's properly formatted and in a good shape and do a, and offload a lot of the work that admission controllers would typically do, right? So if you're looking at things like, um, if you're looking at things like uh, OPA gatekeeper yeah. and uh, things like the, uh, the ability to evaluate these manifests to understand that they're using recent versions of APIs and those sorts of things, then in a GitOps flow, you have the ability to handle to offload some of that work to the GitOps flow, which I think is pretty cool. But at the same time, admission control is about whether that object is admitted into the cluster or not. Like, and so while yeah, you've, you've got kind of the, the way I like to think about it is you're using the PR as the gates into Git, 
and then you're using the admission controller as another set of gates into the actual cluster. Because again, it is your just your definition of change. Whereas once it's hit the API, you're now you know changes are actually going to get applied. So yeah. I I, th I still think that those are you know still two valid components. You can still run um, OPA or kind of um, rego or policy checks um, yeah. as part of your PR flow, but you also want to have something at the front door um, to make sure that you know. You, ca you catch those rogue employees, I guess, that uh, just YOLO merge straight into master and it gets there. Yeah, fact. And I mean, admission control is is like the bouncer, you know, like, and so I don't think that, uh, you know, I don't know, what's the word there? So like if somebody mailed me a bunch of IDs and, and I was able to look at that ID and understand that like this ID is from somebody who is 21 years old or whatever, I can let them into the club. When they show up at the club, that's not going to get them in the door. <laughs> I, I still need some way to actually understand for sure before they actually get admission that yeah that they I, are. I like Paul's way. <laughs> like, I, uh, I like Paul's way of putting it where he says trust but verify. I yeah. think that's exactly. So I don't think it eva evaluate. I don't think it obviates the need. It's a good question though. So I was saying that this centralized flow is kind of a similar is, is is a neat one because it actually talks to like the way that people have been doing this stuff forever, right? And we'll probably continue to do it forever, um, but. And that is that, you know, I was actually joking with Steve earlier. I was like, it's, it's like, uh, you know, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And I think that a lot of people swing Jenkins around that way and have been and have been for a long time. So if we're getting to a place where we actually are embracing continuous deployment, then typically we would just continue uh, using Jenkins to handle that deployment aspect. But does this mean that we can't have GitOps? Right. And in my opinion, it doesn't. Right. It means because like where how you hold the configuration for uh, for what will be deployed and where you handle the manipulation of that configuration before deployment doesn't really change the fact that you're using a transactional model that you're getting the benefits of having uh, of having Git in front. Like I think that you still have GitOps even if you're using Jenkins to handle deployment, or even if you're using Spinnaker to handle deployment. Right? You're still having if you're if you're still engaging with a model where you're handling pull requests for changes. For that desired state, you're still able to have what's called a centralized flow in GitOps. That you're yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I think that all, all we're doing here is we're talking about the uh, the area in which the execution environment is is right. So you've got it there as being outside of the Kubernetes cluster, or maybe it's inside another Kubernetes cluster that's running Spinnaker or Jenkins. But that thing is pushing changes into the cluster. But again. Flux or other CI agents are still running applies against an API server, but they just happen to be running inside the same cluster that you are yeah. um, deploying to. Some of the challenges, uh, some of the challenges in the centralized flow, which are kind of interesting, are that um, you know that that Spinnaker or Jenkins that's running here in the middle um, has to have pretty significant access to a bunch of different clusters, um, and having to and making sure that you like handle credentials and those things. Uh, securely and rationally when dealing with like a centralized flow can be a little challenging, um, but it is super important um, because this because it, because you're doing this execution here, this means that the, when you're handling this execution and applying those manifests to your target clusters, they have to have uh, right against those target clusters. They need they typically would need to be able to create namespaces, perhaps create users, create all the different all the different resources within that cluster, depending on the scope of the work that's being applied, right? And so things can, like that's a lot of permission. That's a that's a big expensive uh, uh, security challenge <laughs> to solve when you're centralizing like this, right? Whether whether you centralize that on a like whether instead of actually centralizing this in to like a single um, Jenkins or a single Spinnaker, you might you might try to like explore the idea of like having of, of breaking that security domain down a little bit, so you're not putting all of the credentials in one basket, as it were. Yeah, I, I still think the other thing to note is that ju just because we're we're running a GitOps paradigm here doesn't necessarily re detract from the fact that we're going to need these kind of CI uh, slash CD machines. The only difference is really where the you know the delivery aspect of this is happening. That's so right. you you know you are you're still going to want to be able to ask Kubernetes potentially you know has my change been applied and am I ready to test it? But that's just a decrease in scope of the communication and the kind of um, levels of permissions yeah. that that CI machine requires to the target clusters. 
One of the other things that I think is actually a benefit to this model, which I think uh, represents a pretty significant challenge when people start trying to like rationalize GitOps patterns, is uh, when I go to a centralized model, I have a serial process perhaps that actually manages the deployment of, of resources and closes the loop, right? I've deployed the thing, it is now deployed, it's in a healthy state. I can report that pipeline healthy and the task is done. Right? I have a closed loop system and I can serialize that across all of my different target environments. And so I have a really good way of understanding like um, on a per task basis, on a per pipeline basis, across all of the pipelines that might be related to a particular deployment, where I am in that process, where I am in convergence or where I am in, in, in successful output. And where we get into some of the challenges are like when we go to a decentralized flow, obviously when the X, sorry, I hate the word obviously, I gotta remove it, you hear me say it, you know, remind me. Um, when we go to a decentralized flow, we have the challenge of, while we get a, a better autonomy down here at the, at the cluster where we have like an operator or some code running in the cluster, that watches for config changes and applies them. The, um, the challenge is how do these clusters on the outside actually report up to some centralized piece so you can understand convergence, so you can understand health and those sorts of things. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, I think that personally, the way that we use it is we kind of use a uh, kind of culmination of both of them. So. We, we have a, a decentralized flow where we have agents running inside the clusters, but again, they are writing back to Git after they have made changes. Um, but we still have CI machines, um, and their jobs are to, to produce images, which I know we're going to come on to. And then the agent is going to sit inside the Kubernetes cluster, see the change in images, make the change to the Kubernetes cluster, and then write that back to kind of keep that audit trail. Um, but we're not detracting from the need of having that CI machine. We're just reducing the scope of the communication that it requires with the target environments. That totally makes sense. Yeah, and I think that's represented in this diagram by like looking at like, you know, the app code CI piece, right? There's still a CI here to handle things like generating the artifact, pushing the artifact to an image registry, um, uh, you know, generate and, and those sorts of things. And typically you would also still be running Git to handle like PRs against changes in configuration, how many of a thing are, are running, and those sorts of things are all still, yeah, are still, I, all I, still in scope. I think that um, we actually, prior to this, had a, um, a centralized flow, but the issue is that it, it makes that CI machine or the kind of um, environment that is, is pushing changes into the cluster, that, that's really the source of truth. So yeah. rather than having a you know, declarative um, kind of, you know, you're declaring it in Git and then allowing the, the cluster to become aligned with that declaration. Paul C calls out that centralized also makes it easier to think about feature flagging and routing to different versions of for canarying and these sorts of things. And Gavin says, is GitOps not making deployments themselves declarative in some way? They are, yep. And everything else in cube already is. It almost feels like it should be a first class citizen of cube. And I, I think it's actually, I mean, you, Gavin, you make a good point, And I think that's actually why, like, you know, we're doing this episode because we do see a lot of interest in this model for almost exactly that reason. Um, and yeah, centralized, like, you know, having, this is definitely like a control conversation. Like in a centralized model, you have a lot more control over where you are in the process. Like you, you could make these pipelines in, you could make these pipelines relative to one another because you're, because you have control of, over that entire problem domain, right? Like if I had, let me just go back a slide. If I had my, um, my Jenkins environment here and it was gonna go ahead and deploy changes to these three clusters, because we're still talking about a centralized flow here, I could say, well, deploy it to this cluster and then wait for that to become healthy, wait for tests to pass, to understand if things have improved before moving on to the next pipeline that would deploy to the next two clusters or the next cluster. Where I like in GitOps, we have a, we'd have to, or sorry, in the flow where you have an operator running in the cluster, that would have to happen in a different way because you don't have the context. I, I, I think you, you, you can do that, Duffy. Um, I, I think it's just the kind of communication. Again, I kind of am harboring on the point here a little bit, um, mm -hmm. but you're, it, it's just the communication, right? So we can still wait for it to go to dev and then, and then go to staging and we can have ways of being able to manage that. I think it's just, shifting the way that changes get uh you know deployed to the cluster it's just a kind of different mindset really so, um 
different way of thinking about things. And the way that you do that is by, you know, uh, man so like, and we'll get into this, I think, when we start playing with the, with the um, repository that you shared, but like, the way that you're handling signaling is basically is based on when your target clusters see that there is an update in the configuration that they would apply. So you have... Yeah, either that or a new image tag at a given kind of tagging structure, essentially. They're the two ways. So you can either... The, the way that changes hit the target cluster is you make a change to Git and you merge to master and we reconcile. Or a new image uh, tag is available in the... Exactly like this. A new image tag is available in the registry. The agent sees it and deploys that. So we have a kind of two-way... Uh, yeah. Way of so in this case, so in the decentralized flow that we were describing, this is kind of like where people generally start, right? They'll have like, they may use Flux or, um, or Argo CD or any, any, any tooling here in the middle to handle or in, any tool like inside of the cluster to handle like watching for, for particular resources they would apply and managing the deployment of them. Um, <clears throat> and what we're pointing out in this next one is perhaps a different model uh, which is, I guess, closer to what you were like. like what you were pointing out is this something closer to what Metal does, wherein um, you have your app code and you have your config code, and you're and you're still managing it the way that you would normally do. Um, but the difference is that we might have a model where you make a deployment, and you've deployed that thing, and then the logic running inside of that operator inside of the cluster is a little bit more advanced, right? Like the logic inside of that operator might be not only watching for config changes, but also to see if there is a more recent tag for a particular version of something that was deployed. And if there is a more recent tag, let's go ahead and, and, uh, and pull that new tag down and try to apply it, and then notify up into the config section on success that the new tag is now the base image or the, the base deployment object rather than having the developer have to actually uh, push a new change to the configuration repository when there is a new tag, we're, off, we're offloading some of that logic to an operator running in the cluster. Yeah, for, for us, specifically a Metal, if we take that as a kind of example, um, we, we strive for a, a self-service model whereby we will help them define the configuration once, and they are responsible for shipping features, right, or, or image changes, and the agent that's sitting inside Kubernetes is, is structured in such a way that it understands when changes are made to the image registry and reconciles those. So we have a very small config, um, well, it's a large config repository, but in terms of complexity, um, it's reduced, and they don't have to become Helm chart and, uh, experts or know how customize works. All they have to do is understand the values that they need to put into the Helm chart. And then, thankfully, Flux and other um, GitOps kind of tooling has CRDs and, and kinds that are available to use that the agent that's running inside the cluster can understand and kind of do the heavy lifting that, in the past, something like Jenkins or Spinnaker or any other CI/CD machine was doing. Um, but it's now running inside. Yeah, Brian calls out that like GitOps is a term like DevOps, and people are going to make definitions fit where whatever they have. And I agree with that. It's, <laughs> it's been fascinating to watch, like that develop over time. Um, <clears throat> the next, I also have uh, trying to switch to Argo C, App of Apps, and Jenkins says Space Boy, and then Wymo has a couple of questions. You could have a proliferation of a cluster like staging, production, dev, etc. And if you have a non-centralized approach, how would you handle things like a rollback, for an example? When something fails at each uh, at at a particular stage, right? So the idea being like, like what is the detail around handling the serialization of this stuff? Like if we were to deploy to a dev environment and some part of that deployment failed, how do we notify the other clusters not to make a change? And what's interesting, I think I'm going to take a shot at this one, but care, but catch me if I if if I'm wrong on this. I think what's different is that you're changing the perspective of the subject a little bit, right? Instead of saying all of these see the truth all the time. You're saying you can control what each cluster sees as the truth that needs to apply, right? Whether that means in a branch or whether that means in... Oh, um, yeah, different different branches, different tags. You could, all, you could all track master and the only difference between environments that get 
uh, deployed as a new image tag that gets uploaded as an example. And then the, you know, the GitOps agent that's running in dev is looking at dev tags and the GitOps agent that's running in staging is looking at staging tags. Yep. And it's looking at that all the time. And you've deployed to dev and dev has failed. Well, then don't, de don't upload a new image with the staging tag. And then, because that means that the agent won't see it and nothing's going to get changed. But say you did mess it up, right? And you do want to roll dev back. Do you just re-tag back to the old, do you just move the tag back or do you? Um, so I'm going to talk specifically about Flux. I haven't really looked in great depth about um, about Argo CD and uh -huh. other, other tooling that's available. Um, but with Flux, you have the uh, option in a, in a Helm release, the same kind of way that you do with a Helm chart, the ability to be able to force a rollback. Um, with Flux, you can actually add a field to your Helm release that says rollback true. And then if it fails, it will roll it back to the previous version. Um, so that, the kind of, um, tooling is there. Um, you're just declaring it in a in a YAML file, essentially, or in a resource, rather than in a command that gets executed from a centralized location. Yeah. Policy was we use moving tags. We just tag a particular Git shot of with dev stage. Okay, that makes sense. And then have Argo CD application at each particular. Git. So it sounds pretty similar. Yeah. I, it's curious. I mean, like I'm wondering about the tag piece of it because of the way that. Kubernetes handles tags. So are you are you like just like absolutely all in on always pull? Like are you like like it has to always be always pull no matter what, so you don't end up in that state where you have a tag that you've referenced that is no longer unique? So like, the are... tags have to be unique, right? I think that's 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 a critical part of it with within reason, right? Or you, you don't, it doesn't have to be. Um, but for us personally, we have a you know we have a number of different environments. And the way that we tag images are the environment prefix dash and then the long commit sha. Because uh, the commit sha loops back to the pipeline that's been executed on its way to production. So nice. it's tag with dev dash commit. And then fl the flux agent or the GitOps agent inside the dev cluster sees it, deploys. The CI machine is essentially sit sat there waiting and saying, has it deployed, has it deployed, has it deployed? The answer is yes. Runs its dev tests re-tags the images stage dash commit char uploads to the image registry and then the loop just completes it's just test rinse and repeat and when it sees that success and it's only on success that it pushes the change to config like like it the operator in your case like flux would actually understand that we are you know at seven of seven replicas or what have you and then we move so, so you know, flux doesn't um doesn't care about that specifically mm. it cares about the image tag that's getting deployed so the change that you're deriving, the change that we are making, because the Helm release or the specification hasn't changed. The only thing that has changed in this context is the image tag. So it will push back to Git the fact that the image tag has changed. So you've got kind of a, there's two ways of making changes. One is straight to Git. And then the other one is the agent inside seeing the image registry tag difference and then writing back to Git, uh, Git sorry. So you've kind of got that bi-directional um, okay. way of making changes. From the security perspective, I think it's kind of interesting to think about the fact that you have a writable, that you have a, uh, that you are able to commit to Git from inside the cluster. So like how you yeah. secure that credential and like how you understand, um, like how you handle that credential kind of becomes pretty important. Yeah, I think it's it's a slightly easier problem though to, to from that perspective than worrying about the permissions that you're kind of centralized deployment tool of choice in our case Jenkins or Spinnaker has on each individual cluster changing yeah. that and changing a, a secret essentially inside Kubernetes uh, there's you know one is a little bit more easy than the other so cool all right well those were the slides I had to dig through here now I want to get into playing with this stuff let's let's, let's dig into it so Steve has put up a couple of repositories that explore this stuff and they're linked from the episode notes. One of them is GitOps with Customize and the other one is GitOps with uh, Secrets. We're going to dig into the GitOps with Customize one first. And so help me kind of get me walking through this stuff. I'm going to walk through the, the setup here and we're going to just kind of play with things and get things going see what we can see what we can see here. So I'm going to start with a fork. T 
to to Walid's point in the in the chat. Um, we we don't track latest tags. We we specifically track environment prefix tags. So production, as an example, is just a PRD dash tag. Yeah. I was just realizing I'm now in code spaces. I'm going to go play with that at some point, but I haven't done it yet. Have you looked at code spaces at all yet? Not yet. Anybody out there in the audience played with code spaces? I'm kind of curious about how it's looking. Walid, can you explain a little bit more about what you mean specifically by uh, testing in that scenario? Code spaces work, but I prefer my local Mac environment. I imagine that's probably true. Uh, while he's saying, no. So lo for local development, we use you know the option is there to use find cluster like um, like Duffy showing. You can build the image locally and upload it, and you could just have blocks looking at any arbitrary tag. Um, but once it hits the pipeline to uh, production to your commit, it's going to be using environment tags. Through, through all the environments, from sandbox all the way up to production. Okay, this work with your repository. Read the first steps here. I've got kind. I've got customized. Make sure I have a recent version of kind. And Helm. It's always something different, yeah. So three five four good enough, or should I go for the latest? Uh, yeah, let's go with three five four. Okay. We'll see. We'll see what happens. We'll live dangerously, Duffy. That's right. And then the other one's Helm three, which I believe I've got. Hey Dan. And then I've got Helm three two four, which I think is. What we're looking yep, for. that's good. Do you use the so Paul C is saying. Do you use the tags all the way to the image, or do you have something that ties tags to digests? Uh, no, so we are kind of banking on the fact that it's unlikely that a long commit char is going to clash. Um, and we, yeah, everything is just environment prefix dash the long commit char, and that's kind of what we're going with. And yeah, Mahmoud's right with what he's saying. You can set up different roles for different Git paths. Okay, so Duffy, do you want me to run you through how to get this thing set up? Sure thing. So if you if you uh, go to your um, terminal and go to this, um, there's a scripts directory in there, and we need to make a change to your uh, to that scripts. Yeah, that flux in it. So I think what would be useful actually is if you go back to the notes before we kind of make a bunch of changes. Um, I, don't, I don't have that. Uh, you're going to need that. Let's go make that happen. Um, is it fluxcd.io or is it? Fluxctl. Flux. Uh, T T. Oh, uh, it's just in it's github.com slash fluxcd. All right. Oh, that's not what I wanted. All right. Why am I to your question whilst uh, Duffy is um, installing this? Um, there are a number of um, unsupported, specifically for Flux, there's a couple of um, like Flux Cloud and there's Flux, uh, Flux UI as well, which kind of has a UI on top. Um, and then there's other tools, obviously, like Argo CD that have an actual UI that allow you to be able to 
um, specifically see what's going on with those changes. saying we need to edit this yeah so i was just going to say if we go back to the show notes it may make sense for for people that are unaware of how this kind of concept works to just show a couple of diagrams of what's going to go on here let's do that so yeah if you just open those first three links that would be great so i've just kind of showed the di oh we're going to have to uh, yeah, get that back down to a reasonable actually let me just open this tab this image in a new tab Perfect. All right. <laughs> so for those of you who are kind of unaware of, of how Flux works, so, um, Flux is going to sit inside our cluster and it's going to use a, uh, a kind of key, an SSH key that we're going to have to upload to our Git repository. And it's going to sit there and reconcile or sync the state of the world in, as rega in regards to um, the Git repository. And then, as well as that, we are going to be looking at, once we set it up, um, for new images um, based on a specific tag. And those are um, backed into a memcache pod or a set of pods um, for, for kind of image synchronization. And then all Flux CD is doing is essentially doing the apply and the delete of those uh, manifests to the Kubernetes API. And then it's exactly the same. So just replace kind of Flux in the kind of apply stage with um, one of the centralized tooling that we were talking about. Um, so that's kind of how no, some YAML files are going to get deployed. So there's going to be some RBAC, there's going to be some namespaces. That's the kind of flow that we're going to go on from that perspective. Um, and then Duffy, if you go across to the next um, tab that you've got open there, you'll have the same problem, unfortunately. Is this one here? Uh, no, the, the one to your left. Yeah, this one here. All right, new tab. So another component that we're going to deploy alongside Flux is um, the Helm operator. And the Helm operator's job essentially is to take custom resources that are called Helm releases. And for those of you who are not familiar with Helm releases, essentially think about it as a chart at a given version and then a set of values that are defined inside that Helm release. And what we're going to do is we're going to deploy the Helm release as part of our synchronization with the repository. And then a Helm operator, which is another component, is going to be the application that is responsible for essentially performing things like the Helm upgrade or the Helm rollback. Um, but what we're doing is we're declaring the state that we would like that to be in. And then the Helm operator is going to be the thing that's responsible for actually executing Helm commands. Cool. And then finally, we have a, um, so they're the kind of two components that we're going to deploy inside the cluster. And then the way we're actually going to set it up in terms of a um, Git repository is we're going to use Customize. So for those of you who are not familiar with Customize, how that works is you essentially have a base or a set of base resources, and you apply patches on top of them. So what we're going to do is we've got a base directory that has all of the um, YAML files or resources that are non-environment specific. So think of things like you may have, um, you wouldn't have in there things like URLs or ingress host names and things like that. Um, and then we're going to have a environment directory, which is going to define those environment specific config changes. So that just allows us to be able to dry up the repository. So we're going to have a lot of stuff in base, and then we're just going to have the diffs in our environment directories. And those environment variables are going to be are, are going to be something that we configure on a per cluster bit cluster basis, right? So that they understand like they're only looking at what would be the resultant manifest from that particular. Absolutely. So so we are going to we're going to tell Flux to look at that repository and look at a very specific directory in terms of its execution path, and it's only going to deploy those resources that come out the back of that. Cool. Paul C says, how does Flux manage the relationship between chart version and app version? So 
I what you're doing with blocks is we're defining how the helm release looks like. So the helm release, as you'll see in a second, is the thing that couples the um, the chart version with a specific version at the point of execution. And I think that's important to know. So we are this is a first time execution into the environment. And then we're going to use the image tag automation that we saw um, on a couple of diagrams ago to, to make changes to our application. And we're going to do that with an annotation that we're going to put on the Helm release. So they are kind of a little bit decoupled. So the way that we do it at Metal specifically is a, a Helm chart version is tied to an environment. So think about like the one Kubernetes 114 to Kubernetes 116. They deprecated a set of APIs. So we needed to make a major change to our Helm chart to use the new um, API versions that were available to us. So for us to bump those changes through environments, we change the Helm chart version in that given environment. And that no, we know then that charts that start with 2.x are able to be deployed to the target environment that's 1.16. And then 1.x is back on Kubernetes 1.16 and prior. So they're kind of a little bit decoupled there. Yeah. <laughs> that's fair, Tim. I have actually thought a couple of times about making a Slack channel for this, but I, I don't know. I don't know if I have the wherewithal to get that done in Kubernetes. That would be a fun one, though. Kind of keep the conversation going in between. Eric says it might be easier if you think about Flux like an automated version. Kubectl will apply. Yeah, I agree. That's, I agree that, that is that is exactly what it's doing. It reconciles the state of your Git repository, patches all of your all of the YAML files and all of the resources that it has locally to the Flux pod. Yep. runs a kubectl apply against the target cluster and then reports any changes that it makes back to git yeah that makes sense yeah this piece here so basically they're saying don't do this part anymore because now you're going to be managing that that apply aspect by right there inside the cluster by leveraging flux cd to do the apply to the to the local api server yeah that's probably a good idea i think i'll I have some time maybe next week to work on that. All right, so let's get into it here. So what were you yes. thinking the changes would need to be? What we're going to need to do here is your Git repo is going to be different. So you're going to be not pointing to mine. You're going to be pointing to yours. Fair enough. Um, Fair enough. I think what's a good starting point is for us to slowly but surely make our way down this. So a couple of things to note. Flux is going to be looking at a Git directory. So if you go up to line 14, Duffy, um, you can see there we're going to be looking at the customized dev directory. So Duffy's going to basically spin up a dev cluster, essentially. Um, yep. We are going to look at the dev root, which is going to be, um, sorry, not the dev root, the git root, which is going to be master. Um, and then that is the kind of branch that we're, we're going to look at. All right. So the first thing we need to do in terms of the script is we need to deploy Flux. And Flux needs to sit and look at a given Git directory and a Git repository. So those are the couple of steps in there. The important thing to note here um, is um, line 10 here. Uh, yeah, line, no. Sorry. Line, well, the, the, the manifest generation equals true line. So that's used um, because we are using customize. If you're, because customize needs to generate the manifests that are going to get created. If you're not using customize, you don't need that line. Um, and then what we're saying here is we're going to set the image poll uh, interval to one minute. So every one minute, we're going to start looking for new images and new image tags that are available to us. Um, and then we are going to allow garbage collection. So if Duffy goes ahead and deletes something in Git, we should be deleting something in Flux. Oh, nice. Um, then we're going to install the Helm operator um, as well. That's the other component that we're going to want in there. Um, comes as a CRD, so we need to um, deploy the CRD first and then deploy um, the Helm operator. This specific implementation, we are telling the Helm operator that it's going to run in, um, going to use Helm v3. You can pass v, a v2, comma v3 here if you want, um, but for us, we're, we're going to deploy um, v3. So the Helm operator is going to be able to use um, Helm v3 inside, inside of the pod. And you're keeping them both in the same namespace? Um, you don't have to. Um, we, we're actually going to see what happens in a minute. We're going to deploy a number of different Helm operators into a number of different uh, namespaces. But again, what we want to do here is we want to keep 
the interaction with um, Kubernetes from a kubectl perspective low. We want a lot of the stuff in the repository that gets reconciled. So this is the minimum amount of stuff that we need to do to get ourselves out of the gate. Where is the key coming from? It looks like it's referencing uh, an so, so Flux by default, if you don't specify a key, is going to create a key for you. So what we're going to do further down is this command down here is going to go and get the key for us. Um, so it's going to wait. We're going to wait for the key to be ready. Uh, and then we're going to have to copy that key into your GitHub repository. Right. And then we create the connection. Um, cool. Yeah, so if we've got, a, we've got a cluster set up and we've got a cube config set up, we should just be able to run this. All right, let's give it a try. Creating our namespace. Do an install of Flux CD. So, Waimo, to your, to your question, um, we essentially have a, a task inside of our CI um, tooling that has a timeout of, of five minutes. And if it times out after five minutes, it's time for us to kind of go in and start to look around. Um, but it, it, it's normally relatively fast. And if you think about how we're differentiating this, because we're using a Helm release, the thing that Flux is actually polling and, and deploying to the cluster our Helm releases. It's really the Helm operator here that's doing a lot of the heavy lifting. That's the thing that's doing the Helm upgrades or the Helm installs or the Helm rollbacks. So it's really how do we split out um, the Helm operators that we have available and the Helm releases that they are responsible for. Just popping this SSH key in here real quick. To Mahmoud's point in the chat about yeah that's Flux is this, yeah Flux is exactly it's doing the kubectl apply based based on the state that it's currently synced from Git at the time. I'm gonna step away for just one second, so if you all want to chat, I'll be I'll be right back. Space Boy, to your point, um, we deploy Prometheus with Flux, so I would assume that there wouldn't be any reason why you wouldn't be able to do that with Argo. So why am I you're saying, okay, but I'm wondering if you still need something at the application level that is customized to say that it is all installed. So we have that in, in terms of other, other pods ready, like the liveness and readiness probes, and we use those as a way to know whether the, the pods or the microservices that have just been launched have, um, are ready to receive um, live traffic. We don't have anything specific inside of the application itself. We just leverage some of the things that Kubernetes provides us out of the box to instrument and the applications in such a way that Kubernetes is aware of when they're launched. Um, the Matty, do we do you also use Flux to update Flux version? Uh, absolutely, it kind of uh, turtles all the way down. So we install this main Flux. Um, Buffy's actually installing it at the latest version, but we could install it manually um, and then have a Flux um, Helm release inside of our Git repository that that upgrades it. That's that's exactly how we do it. Flux can upgrade Flux. All right, so what I did, so there's our key. Yes, if you add that key as a Git, GitHub deploy key to the repository that we're going to be interacting with. Ah, oh, that would have been smoother than what I did. I just added it as one of the keys for my own personal account, planning on removing it later. So it's, it's authenticating as me at the moment, rather than a deploy key for that particular repository. Although that would be smoother. So let's do that instead.
You hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Okay, good. And the full seize point um, is blocks operated using Helm and Still Helm. Yeah, Mahmood has answered that. Yeah, it's it's doing the the helm install and helm upgrade command. It it can't do um it can't do helm template. So what we're kind of doing a little bit is um we're using the the kind of helm release and customize to do some of that before um with Flux so that Flux deploys the right specification in terms of the helm release, and then by the time it reaches the helm operator, it's got everything that it needs. And if you make sure, Duffy, that you tick the box at the bottom, because um, we weren't going to write back some changes. All right, there we go. OK, so if we keep CTL get pods in flux namespace, Things are so running. we're seeing now that we've deployed Flux. We've got a mem cache there ready to uh, be caching all of our image tags when we're ready. Um, and then finally, we have a Helm operator there that is going to be the thing that is responsible for um, deploying our, our Helm releases. So Duffy, if we kind of maybe switch back to the repository and kind of step through that. So let's start with the customized directory and maybe maybe build from there. Sure. So the customized directory um, has has a base, and a base is going to deploy a number of different resources into our Kubernetes cluster. So you'll see that we'll deploy Cert Manager. Um, inside the cluster, we're going to have a number of different things. Um, so we're going to have a Helm release, uh, a couple of those. We're going to have some namespaces that get deployed, um, a sealed secrets controller. Imagine we're going to we're going to be using Bitnami seal secrets to deploy our uh, secrets into Cube, and then finally some some uh, storage classes. And if you look at customize.yaml, just to give people a kind of understanding of how this kind of gets built up. So in our customization, the resources that we have are essentially the YAML files that are in the current directory. Um, well, are um, relative to the directory that this customization.yaml is is currently sitting within. So it's interesting. Go ahead. I was like, it's interesting that it's trying to create, or that I see it referencing a cube system namespace. Is that because you're labeling it? Yeah. Okay. And then you create the platform system and a sealed secrets namespace, and then you have some CRDs for sealed secret, and then the Helm release for it. And then these, there is already a storage class uh, model for um, on top of kind, although it is. Uh, very node specific, so anything that's been deployed leveraging that storage class will re will rely on it. But it is set as a default one, so I don't know if that'll mess us up or not. But we'll we'll get down the road here a little bit and see. Let's see what these do. Yeah, because there's no there's no store there's no provisioner like this inside of my environment. Do we end up using those storage classes for other things? Uh, no, we don't. Just All an right. example. Of Right. of the stuff that we can deploy there. We'll just leave it, um, we'll leave it be there. To, to Mahmood's point of how does customize handle ordering, does it does it apply CRDs before others? So it, it, again, what we're doing is we are declaring the state that we would like the cluster to be in, and then Kubernetes is going to try and reconcile that state, right? So there's no kind of concept of ordering. We are essentially giving it, If, if uh, I'll get Duffy to do it, the equivalent of what Flux is doing inside the pod, and you'll see it's just a load of YAML. Um, resources and that gets applied to the Kubernetes cluster, and it's up to Kubernetes to reconcile that and work out how it gets deployed. In this, Flux, go ahead. In this case, though, like I think your point is that there's a race, right? So, like if I if I deploy an operator that defines a bunch of CRDs, for example, then how does the uh, then like is it just going? Is it because Flux will continue to try and apply those resources until it actually succeeds that the CRDs are defined? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So yeah. you're going it, it, to, exactly, it's, it's trying to reconcile the state. The, the first reconciliation loop may fail, but it's going to keep trying over and over and over and over again. Got it. What else we got? Since Flux is trying to sync state from Git, local modifications in the cluster will get overridden. I think that's true, and I, I, that is, that I look is, forward to is, playing with that. Yeah, Yeah, that, that is correct. Uh, and note that will bite you. It's been in me plenty of times as well. Um, you, you, you're in a race. 
So yeah. if you if you're allowed to do QTTO edit, you've got enough time until Flux realizes that there's something different for you to uh, try and work out what's going on. I used um, to I used to refer to this as technology gaslighting. You know, because like if you're if you worked in a very locked down shelf chef or puppet environment, like you apply a change to a file and you're like, great, looks like it's working, and then what happened? Where did the change go? I know that I just <laughs> it put it back so... again, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty wild. I remember like I remember being beat up on that one before, and the one that got me was like a it was a configuration file, and it didn't have a header that said that it was actually under the ownership of Puppet, and so the change happened, and I was not expecting it to happen, and I didn't even understand that because it was I was doing consultant work at the time, right? So I didn't. I had no way of understanding that this was actually still under pretty under hard control, and it was really. I was like, "Am I losing my mind? Is that what's happening?" <laughs> it was um, brutal. So yeah. To, so uh, to, yeah, maybe if we go back to basis sec, Duffy, I, I just want to kind oh, of sorry. show an example home release so that people are kind of. Sure thing. Um, if we go to cluster, um, maybe go to home releases and see what one we've got in there. Uh, yeah, let's just do Chaos Keeper as an example. Uh, I like to live dangerously. So, so as you can see here, uh, a, a Helm release or a Helm resource, sorry, um, you have a number of different annotations. So that annotation on line six there is essentially saying that we don't want automated image updates. So I'm going to force the image that currently gets deployed as part of this Helm shot, and I do not want you to make any changes after you've deployed it. And then in the specification, we are defining the chart that we want deployed in the version that we want it to be deployed from, and then a release name. And that release name needs to be unique at the cluster level. Um, if you don't do that, then you're going to get yourself in a little bit of a mess. Um, I've, I've been bitten by that a couple of times. And then these values are essentially the values that you want to override from the default Helm chart. And that's kind of how they all um, come together as a group. So that's kind of the definition of a of a Helm release. So it's a chart at a given version with a release name and then the values that you want to override. So when you set this value saying automated false, um, what, what are you turning on or off there? Are you saying so that I, like... I, I'm saying that the default image tag that gets deployed as part of this Helm chart, I do not want you to look for changes and update it. I just want you to leave it where it is. And if I want to make a change to that, then I'll make a change to the Helm release. If you want to make a change to the image tag, you have to explicitly set it in this Helm release. Got it. All right. And the default so, and the default automation setting for this apparently from Eric is false for Flux. So Flux won't do it automatically, but we're just being very explicit because explicit is better. Yeah, than I like to be explicit <laughs> and make sure that when I go back and if Flux for some reason changes this to true, uh, I, I know that explicitly that in my in my Helm release I'm that makes I'm sense. Nice. I like I like the excluded days of the year. Don't do it on April Fool's Day because that's just cruel. <laughs> Skip Christmas. And exclude the weekends because I don't want to get smell. <laughs> exactly. All right, cool. So let's go. Can we jump into the dev environment now and take a look yeah, at what? Yeah, sure. So obviously, base has got a set of directories, and then inside dev, if you look here, um, if you go to something like monitoring, maybe as an example here. Um, so if we look at the Helm releases inside of monitoring and we'll see Grafana. And here is where we have the environment specific config. So mostly ingress, right? The host name. You could even um, move the TLS name and have it always standardized to Grafana if you wanted to. Okay. So what this is going to allow us to do is it's going to take the Helm release for Grafana that currently sits in base, blend it with this one. And by the time it gets to Flux, it's going to have both of them and it's going to kind of see it as one. So um, you have make installed. Which? Make. Make, yeah. So um, if you go to the make file, we can kind of show what this is doing locally. Um, All right. So do that. If you run um, the command, uh, yeah, if you scroll up, there should be a, there's a test. Actually, I'm just going to. Well, I'll leave these things in place because I already have a cluster. So there is a make test. Make your Yeah, so how customize works for anyone that's um, unfamiliar with this is it runs the concept of customize build. And what customize build does is it trawls the customize.yamls from the base, so from the place that you're executing it or the directory that you're executing it, all the way up as far as it needs to go, all the way into base and everything. 
and then it provides you and produces you a single YAML file. So what we're going to do here is um, Duffy's going to run a customized build against dev. We're going to pipe that out to a YAML file, and you're going to see essentially what Flux is going to see the first time that it reconciles the repository. All right. So you make test. test dev dash dev. And then if you open up that. So this will be what the, is deployed to this cluster. So we're. Yeah, so if you look for Grafana, if you do a search for Grafana or something like that. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, wide open. <laughs> so, so you'll see in here it's reconciling everything from base, and then it's also going to be doing the overrides as well. Uh, it's an F, not a. Yeah. I don't know why. I don't know why I do that, but I do that frequently. So here's like, if you were to do, uh, what is the command in Helm? It's like Helm template. Yeah. Helm, Helm template. Yep. Yeah. We're essentially doing that, but we're doing it at the kind of Helm, Helm resource directly. Exactly. So. So if you were using the chart directly and you were to do Helm template and pass in the values, we would be able to see the output very similar to what we're looking at in this particular context. Only yeah. difference is that this is still somewhat relative, right? Like this is still looking at like the Helm. They're still looking at the Helm object, like as a Helm release. Correct. So here are a bunch of plugins that are being enabled. Oh, interesting. So this isn't actually all the way down to the detail yet. This is still interacting with the Helm object as a release. So yeah. So what we are giving to Flux, what we're giving to the um, to the cluster is we're giving a Helm release, and then the Helm operator is going to see that uh, resource and it's going to go and do something with it. Yeah. And it's essentially going to be the thing that converts that Helm release, uh, sorry, that Helm um, release, yeah, into the equivalent of a Helm install, passing in the correct uh, chart with the version and the values that you want to override. Neat. So what this is a useful exercise is to, if you are running changes locally, right, so say you're making quite wholesale changes mm -hmm. and you're unsure or you've made them, you've merged them to master, and you're unsure about what's going on. This is just essentially the equivalent of what Flux is running locally in the pod. It's doing this, and then it's doing a kubectl apply against this. So it's just a way of being up for us to be able to get more of it, uh, a bit more understanding. The, right. the other thing to note, and I think it's very key, um, and Duffy and I were talking about this earlier, is kubectl comes with a customized plugin built in. Yeah, the, that's right. The one that Flux uses is the actual customized binary. It is not the one that comes with kubectl. And they are they are different. So that's why Duffy needed to install customize the binary locally, um, because that's the one that Flux uses. It doesn't use the one inside kubectl. So that's just a kind of key thing to note there. The help that I'm looking for? Yeah, here we go. So it's actually. Um, vendored in to kubectl um, but it is vendored in at kind of an old version which is actually specifically the problem so even though there is like some functionality uh, there is some customized functionality in kubectl itself it's not uh completely up to date and there have been quite a few changes to customize since the vendor since it was vendored in i'm not sure if we're addressing that reasonably in upstream yet but um effectively we kind of stopped time for the customized project with kubectl and Time kept marching on for things like, you know, like what we're playing here with, like Flux and those sorts of things. To, um, to Mal's point about um, through Flux, it does the Helm upgrade or the Helm delete slash install. So a key thing to note here is that Flux is just deploying those kinds. So the, the thing that's actually implementing and interacting with Helm commands is the Helm operator. And you have a number of options. So it's, it's essentially doing a Helm upgrade, um, but you can actually set force um, to true, and that will essentially do the equivalent of a delete and then an install over the top. So you have the option to do that. You can say forceful true. Oh, nice. All right, let's get some stuff deployed here. So shall I just apply the test, or do you, you want to go, or do you have a different mechanism for? Uh, no, so we've established a connection now. To That's Flux. right, sorry. So we should be in a position whereby we can now, if you do kubectl get namespaces, we should be able to actually see some things. So there we go. Cert manager's there. We've got the Nginx ingress con uh, controller that should be there as well. Um, yeah, li life's good. Don't. Yeah, pending, here we pending, go. Pending, pending. Probably, yeah, probably lack of resources. 
Got flux secrets creating. When was the moment when we applied this? So you applied this change the minute we added the, the GitHub deploy, deploy key. key. Yeah. The deploy key would have been the moment. That is pretty neat. So a, a couple of other things really to touch on here. So um, if you can, can you do that? But also kind of grep for Helm operator. Yeah. Helm dash operator. So what you'll not notice here is that even though if you when Duffy ran the script, we installed the Helm operator into the Flux namespace. As part of the deployment that comes inside of um, the Git repository, we have got a number of other Flux, uh, Helm operator instances. And then if we actually um, look at one of those, Duffy, so if you do um, kubectl get um, Helm release and then target the one that's running in um, Cert Manager. Uh, and then dash n cert manager, and then you should see a. Uh... Oh no, key thing to note. So they are actually in flux in the flux namespace. So if you do uh, the same command, but dash n flux, and then if you actually describe one of these, um, actually maybe just get it. It's probably going to be easier. Get o yaml or something. So if, yeah, if you scroll, uh, no, scroll down a bit, I think. Yeah, so here we go. So we are deploying a Helm operator, and the Helm operator is obviously a, a Helm chart. And there's a couple of things to note here. So we've explicitly set the version of Helm that we want to use, so Helm version v3. And that's because the Flux instance and the Helm operator that we deployed is specifically set to only understand v3 resources. And then even though the Helm release was deployed to Flux, the target namespace is Cert Manager. So what that means is all of the manifests that come as part of that um, Helm release is essentially the equivalent of putting dash dash namespace equals Cert Manager at the end of your Helm install. And now what we have is we have a, a Helm operator that's sitting inside of the Cert Manager namespace. And all its job is, is to reconcile Helm releases that sit inside of the Helm, uh, the Cert Manager namespace. So we now have a Helm operator per namespace that is responsible for reconciling Helm releases in that namespace, rather than having one huge Helm operator that takes control of everything. That makes a ton of sense. Let's talk about that a little bit more, because that's actually a really super interesting pattern that has been a challenge generally, I think, in controllers, which I think is fun, right? And so what? Yeah. And so what you're saying is that this Helm operator, it is only it it has it's focused extremely narrowed, only to the chart associated with Cert Manager. Only to Helm releases that are deployed in that namespace. Okay. And the reason why we do that, because if you think if we think about it. We don't want if we have you know a huge amount of applications that get that are getting deployed to Kubernetes. We yeah. don't want a Helm operator that's responsible for reconciling all of those Helm shots or Helm releases. Because it will probably yeah. do that serially, and it may, and it may take at that point forever to actually like get around, especially as you grow the number of applications or charts that are being managed. Like you're going to yeah, see. Yeah, it, it's it's an opinionated choice. You don't have to do this. You could have one centralized Helm operator. Um, but what we found is the reconcile loop is great, is much, much faster. Yeah. So um, to, to Waimo's point about, you know, do I need some additional logic? Well, we've sped it up because we have these Helm operators have a very narrow scope of what they look at. So they have a faster iteration loop, which means that we can deploy changes faster. So another question that comes to mind is like from the permissions perspective, if I'm understanding this correctly, then only the Helm operator, like the, the one in Flux, would be responsible for actually pushing changes to Git. No, no, they are. So the only thing that pushes changes to Git is Flux. This is the Helm operator that is that is the thing that is deploying Helm releases. So okay. in terms of a permissions perspective, 
the Helm operator that sits within the Flux namespace has to have cluster admin because it needs to deploy the other Helm operators that are on the other namespaces. But what about the and one in Cert Manager? That's specifically set at just RBAC, RBAC privileges for um, the Cert Manager. There is a very small but here, which is the CRD. So if the Helm operator needs to deploy a CRD, then it needs to have a uh, wider scope. There's no role bindings there. Let's take a look at how... Set manager would probably have a cluster role binding because it needs to deploy the CRD. Would be my oh, guess. Oh, I see. Is there another example, like maybe Ingress? Uh, in yeah, Ingress should have it, I think. But the idea being that you could actually narrow the scope of permissions depending on what. There you go. There's we can actually we can actually tell. So if you go to the Helm if you go to the Helm release, um, there is an option that says whether it needs to be um, cluster scoped or uncluster scoped. Go back to the okay. So that would be here. Yep. So if we scroll up, uh, here's our so back create. Through, yeah, and then if we scroll up, uh, yeah, cluster all through. And the reason for that is because, um, obviously, for us to be able to create certificates, it's going to need to be able to do it at the cluster scope. Yeah. And so if I look at the permissions there, it's probably permissions being granted to cert manager that allow it to watch for resources being created in any namespace that might re might relate to the work that it would have to do. Correct. Yeah. That makes sense. But whereas if we look at the Nginx one, oh, actually, you know, the operate, I guess that would probably be two roles, right? Because there's still... Being able to define an ingress object would be something that we'd watch for in every namespace as well. I think uh, Josh has got a comment that people want us to have a look at. So Josh says, in the decentralized model where there's one Helm operator, you kind of end up with a tiller again. Uh, uh, absolutely. Right, you end up with a with a you know a bus factor of you know 100 <laughs> uh, when when everything is being managed by a single Helm operator. You might as well, yeah, you might as well go back to to v2. Yeah, um, that's a very good point. Yeah, I, I, I again, you, you can do it. There's no reason why not to do it. Um, but what we have found is a kind of large scale, and I'm talking like hundreds and hundreds of, of Helm releases, having this specific structure um, makes life a lot easier. And again, if your application developers are deploying to a specific namespace and you've got the RBAC permissions right, you can give them the ability to see the logs of their Helm operator that's responsible for deploying their Helm releases. And they don't need to try and trawl through one that's also deploying all of the other Helm releases. Paul says it could be Helm, leader with Helm operator with replicas, which reduces it from being a spa. Kind of. But I mean, actually, would that work? Like, does the... Because no, there that, is... that, would, that wouldn't work because you, uh, uh, you could have multiple Helm operators but it'd be, all, it'd be active they're passive. All, yeah. They're all looking at the same kinds. You just got a, you just got three people racing for the same thing. In that model, though, actually, I'm curious. So, in the Helm operator model, do they have it configured in such a way that they do a leader election for who is actually making the change? Or that that's a good question. I don't actually know. Okay. I think we've got some some Weave employees here. I, I recognize some names, so maybe they can. Someone like Mahmood maybe would be able to give an answer to that. Flux does, yeah. I'm not. I'm not sure about the Helm operator. Okay. Well, cool. So let's play with this stuff. Let's let, let's do a little chaos engineering that we were talking about before. So one of the things that we pointed out before was if somebody modifies a resource, then the Helm operator and Flux will both like take their best effort at putting it back the way that it was, or you know, based on the desired state. That's correct. So if we yeah. wanted to trigger this in the Helm operator side of things, if I were to like chuck a config so, map or something, then it should actually try to recreate that config you, map. You could do that, or we could be a bit more brutal and we could we could delete the Helm release completely. Let's try that out. Delete dash uh, Helm release. Ingress. Boop. 
And then if you get the logs from the Helm operator that's currently sitting in that namespace, you'll see exactly what it's doing. All right, first I want to do ingress nginx. So it's like things are deleting and being recreated. So they're being recreated immediately because you've, well, because you, it's done a reconcile loop already and it's putting them back. This is a lot of loop. this is a lot of log information. Yeah, so obviously in that in the in the blog post that I put together where we where we lock it down, once we lock it down a lot more, you get a lot less logs. Yeah. So it looks like it's you know, it's basically creating a version three of these resources, creating twelve resources, recreating it, trying to reconcile it back to that state. I was wondering how how granular it would notice it, right? So if I were to edit the daemon set, for example, dash in ingress, and I chuck a new label in here. That's correct, uh, Zane. To your point, yeah, the, the Helm operator can can be used without flux or um, you don't need it as, as long as you can deploy a helm release in the in the structure that the helm operator understands you could from your centralized location so in uh before we were talking about jenkins you could get jenkins to manually apply apply sorry um helm releases and then the helm operator would sit inside and reconcile those Yeah, I, th I think to kind of the, the, the conversation that's going on in the chat with kind of um, between between Caleb and, and Eric and, and others about using um, using Argo as a way to be able to, to, to make changes to the cluster. Yeah, um, we you could essentially do that with a with a normal CI machine. It's just for for us. It's just how we tag. So we just have we can have manual approval that requires us to tag a new image at a given um, for a given environment. And once that happens, the kind of deployment the deployment happens. So it looks like my change doesn't get detected. Setting a new, adding a new label doesn't modify the release enough that the Helm operator tries to change it. No, because the, the thing that gets changed is the fact that the, the Helm operator has essentially deployed your Helm chart. So at the version, that, at the version that you wanted, so it's fetched it and successfully deployed it. How does it detect that there's drift based on the thing that has been deployed and what it had deployed at the time, or does it? I think it only detects drift of the Helm release itself, from I... from understanding. Okay. Because that's the thing it's in control of. So if I change, if I were to change the image of the daemon set directly, if you change the image. Of the daemon set directly. Eventually, the Helm operator, the flux will kick in, redeploy the new, the correct version from Git, and then the Helm operator should pick it up and redeploy it. I see. So this this would be caught by flux rather than by the Helm operator. That's an interesting point. So let's take a look at that. Keep get all flux dash in flux. Wow, you're getting, that's some pretty interesting log output too, because you can actually see what the flux operator, what flux is doing, applying changes, unchanged. Oh, because it's just recon it's just reconciling. It doesn't try to check to see if there's differences. Yeah, it's just, exactly. Yeah, it's okay. just doing a diff. It's just paving the world every so often. Yep. So eventually I should actually see the output of this change like I should see this go away because no, I won't. 
I won't see that change because it would still it's still the same Helm release. So in, the, in a way, this is actually kind of hiding underneath the covers of things. So even though I've made a modify, I've, I've added a new label, nothing has, uh, from the Helm operator perspective, nothing's changed. Correct. So the only way to really trigger that change would be to actually delete or more significantly modify the object. Um, more significant, yeah, more significant. The, the thing that it's obviously reconciling is if the Helm release itself, so you'd have to go in there and manually edit the Helm release. Yeah. And then force the re reapply. Interesting. That's cool. What other things, audience, should we do to play with like the logic here? Should I go and remove like ingress from the dev cluster and see if it gets deleted? And watch that helma and watch that get up slow? I think that would be fun. Let's let's just start there. And I'll Paul, wait. Uh, to to Paul C's point, he's 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 uh, correct. So Flux has no understanding. Flux is simply the uh, the only understanding that Flux has. Yeah, let's farming that up. Yeah, whether whether or not the Helm release resource has been deployed, and then it's over to the Helm operator to take over. Exactly. So let's go into let's see here, customize dev customization YAML, and let's get rid of. Uh... To Wymo's point about the um, the horizontal pod autoscaler. Um, yes, it, yes, it would. So your your best bet is to probably not specify the values as part of your um, Helm release. So actually you have another way of setting those values because it's going to constantly get in a fight. It's going to scale up and then the Helm operator is going to put it back to the previous value. Oh, so if you, if I were to scale, yeah, that's a good point. So if I'm going to, if I remove the ingress object from the reference and customization at the dev layer, then I should see that ingress object be removed as a Helm release, all the way down the all the way down the stack, right? It, yeah. So the Helm op, yeah, exactly. So this directory here is going to deploy. So let's see, yeah, let's get, Yeah, welcome to customize, uh, having to know the directory structure where everything is. Want to make sure I wasn't like on your branch or anything weird like that. Git push origin move ingress. And we'll go over here. Oh. repository there we go okay so i'm going to go in it's my own master not against your master i don't know why i would pull that uh and then we're <laughs> going to compare we're moving ingress and so i can see the changes that are going to be done here i'm actually basically removing this line and i've actually also because of the other change i made to the flux init script i've gone ahead and modified this piece and then apparently my editor decided to chuck a new line in there just to make things happier so yeah, whilst you're doing that, I'll, I'll answer um, Lamadi's point. So Lamadi said, can you comment on best practice about organizing your Git repositories when you have different environments? So there's a number of different ways you can do this. You could have a different branch um, for your environment, but we prefer to have, and I prefer personally, to have a different directory and always allow the things to track master, um, but just use directories to define which environment you're, you're looking at. The main reason why I like that approach is because it makes the PRs more easily read 
right we're always merging into master we're doing a diff against master you know so to, if you look at what duffy nearly did it was one slip away from merging into the wrong repo or in a kind of or putting multi a pull request against it yeah. multi-branch uh, strategy it could be a different branch and he merges into production instead of instead of dev and he makes the change so i think it's it's horses for courses right you can do this a number of different ways for us um we like this pattern it's easier for for developers especially to, to understand that they're they're going to merge those changes into master and then the directories are going to going to do it yeah and there you go it should uh, eventually disappear flux i was going to look at flux to see what i see there so, yeah okay There's an apply. So I guess we're, we're still waiting for the apply to actually delete it or the delete call. I should see a kubectl delete call here, right? Uh, no, you will see a, a change. Yeah, you should see a delete in terms of the Helm um, release specifically. Boom. Yeah, and I, I think to Gavin's point as well that, that GitOps is not just for applications, right? It's just a way of is, is getting state into the cluster. So you can use it for a number of different things. Secrets, other custom resources that you've got. Think if you're running a Kafka cluster and you want to define your Kafka topics, you'll have blocks that are reconciling those. Um, kind of, you know, it's just a way of being able to get, you know, resources into the cluster, essentially. It could be, could be anything. Nice. So we do see the change. So I actually went ahead and grabbed for delete. So I can definitely see that because I removed that line from the customized value up above when defining the environment that is dev, I remove that from my dev environment, and I see that kubectl delete dash f happening. And now if I do kubectl get ns, I see ingress gone. So there, there we go. We just made a change to the upstream uh, configuration of what's happening inside the cluster, and we've seen it be realized by flux. And what's neat is, is this follow through model, right? Like. The thing that was actually caught, the thing that was told to be deleted was the Helm release associated. And that meant, if I understand it correctly, right? So Flux. No, would've... it wasn't, that wasn't totally correct. So well, it should be the Helm release that was deleted though, right? Uh, no, so we've deleted everything. We've deleted that. So it's everything that is derived within that directory. So if you go back to the repository mm -hmm. and you go to base and you look at what's in base ingress, it's everything that's inside there. So the namespace is gone, the Helm release is gone. Yeah, I guess what I mean, oh, I see. Oh, so it's actually multiple layers. You're right, you're right, you're right. I wasn't yeah. thinking about that correct. Yeah, it's everything in here. So that's why the namespace is gone as well. Mm -hmm. Otherwise the namespace would still be there and only, right. the, only the Helm release would be missing. Yep. That's really cool. I like that. Well, I think we're pretty close to that time, folks. We've been at this, uh, uh, it's coming up on three o'clock. I hope that you all really dug this first TGIK with a guest. Like, I think it's been a tremendous, um, a tremendous time getting that working. Let me see if I can get back to the chat here. Let me actually kick back over also in OBS so that we can get our faces on here. There we go. And then where's my chat? Restore chat. All right. So that was a that was a that was the episode uh, kind of exploring GitOps. We talked a little bit about what GitOps is, like some of the different patterns for it. Um, we had some incredible work by Mr. Steve Wade, who was in London, and it's the very first. Like I love that we're not only are we doing it, the first co-hosted uh, uh, TGIK, but also we did this with like two people on like other opposite sides of the planet, which is <laughs> so. Thank you very much for like. Jumping in this, jumping into this with me. I, I'm, I'm no glad. problem. It was, it was a pleasure. And if, if people have more questions, just feel free to reach out to, to Duffy or myself or anybody else, and I'm I'm more than happy to help you. And his Twitter account is Swade nineteen eighty seven. Yep. And then mine is Maui Line, of course. So you always know how to reach all of us. Um, thanks all again, and we'll see you all next week. Unless you have some last comments. Thanks, everybody. Saying thanks in the chat. Again, thank you all so much. Definitely check us out and play with it. It looks like it's a really easy way to kind of get involved and have some opinionated ways of playing with things and kind of exploring this whole space. 
I can tell you that in my opinion, and likely I, I imagine that quite a few of you share this opinion, that this is definitely a space where there is a lot of interest and a lot of focus. And I imagine as we get more into different GitOps patterns, we're going to see we're going to see this become kind of a new norm. Certainly over things like kubectl apply, that's not how we should be doing this stuff. We should be we should be figuring out how to programmatically manage this stuff in general. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I'll see you all next time. And thank see you, you Steve. Bye. No Cheers. problem. Bye.